So yeah, let me get started. So we do the multiple choice. You will see questions that relate to fluid. That's why it says and the fluid. Uh, when you get to the the free form, you won't see anything that relates to fluid. That's kind of how I've done midterm and final exams in the past. And uh, all I'm really doing this semester is programming in my questions from past to midterms and finals. Um, so. <laughs> um, with some corners cut so um, so yeah let me get started I'm just gonna note the time so that I know how much time I can waste talking and we'll start yeah okay so um, so I think the first three questions should be oscillation Next to three should be uh, waves, and then I think it's two for uh, sound waves, and then two for fluid. So the majority of the weight here is on oscillations and waves. So the first question is asking uh, about simple harmonic oscillator motion, and make sure you don't miss that. Which of the following does not describe that? And I'm just reading through it, hanging from a spring. Probably that that's like typical simple harmonic oscillator. Meso uh, pendulum, we've talked about how it can be approximated as a simple harmonic oscillator. Um, I think this is a little bit difficult. But what it comes down to is any kind of system where you have a stable equilibrium, as in you have a restoring force, when you go away from equilibrium, they can be approximated as a simple harmonic oscillator. That's really why we spend so much time with a simple harmonic oscillator. So the only thing remaining is this one. It just accelerates uh, down the ramp and it doesn't it oscillate. So. Um, Measure the rate of heartbeat. Uh, health practitioner can count the number of heartbeat from the fixed amount of time 30 bits in 15 seconds. Oh, uh, yeah, <laughs> I was saying a lot of these questions are from my physics 10, so they'll be relatively easy. Um, so this one, I the way I prefer to think of it is actually as a unit question. So the number you are given is 30 bits per. 15 seconds and when you look at the choices you have the units of bits per minute so all right i need somehow this to be converted into bits per minute so the bits i have there that's good i can keep it uh, i need to turn seconds into minutes so the unit conversion here okay i'm gonna multiply by one and that one is formed by having seconds on the numerator and I need, the, uh, uh, I need the minutes on the denominator so that I get to the correct units. And I just make sure I write the same physical quantity for these two. One minute is 60 seconds. So just doing this in my head, I think it's 120. So it's probably not a resting heart bit. Uh, it's, I don't know. Um, if that is your resting heart bit, I, then I think you're in trouble. To the correct statement below regarding amplitude, frequency, and period of a simple harmonic oscillator motion. I think this might be automatically generated a question, or dynamically. So these choices might look different. So the periodic, period of a, it's not proportional, it's inversely proportional. A simple and also large amplitude. Um, so these two, uh, oh wait, it's not dynamically generated. Neither of these two answers, it's kind of the defining feature of the simple harmonic oscillator that this is true. Um, that uh, at, And you had a lab on this, so I think uh, I don't have to belabor the point. Um, yeah, and the next three questions will, will be about waves and potentially about standing waves. Um, choose the statement below which correctly defines or describes wavelength. Um, wavelength has nothing to do with amplitude, at least in general. Uh, wavelength is the, yeah, I don't know what this means. It's kind of, we call it word salad. It's a jumble of words that makes grammatical sense, but doesn't say anything meaningful. Um, wavelength is the length of the, yeah, smallest portion of the wave that repeats. Yeah. Um, 
and the spatial extent of wave, the kind of waves that we deal with, like a traveling periodic wave, in the ideal case, they're actually infinite. They have to be over all space. Otherwise, there's an uncertainty in the wavelength. But we talk about that more in physics 4C, uh, which most uh, incorrectly defines or describes nodes and antinodes. Okay, uh, antinodes are locations that exist. Yeah, that seems correct. Maximum displacement, nodes and antinodes annihilate each. Other. Yeah, it, again, this is the word salad. It, it seems to make a grammatical sense, but like, you know, if you understand standing waves and what nodes are, antinodes are, this is like, it's not saying anything that's physically meaningful. Um, yeah, nodes are zero disturbance and yeah, they don't change. And I like to say this is the standing part of the standing wave. Um, locations of where nodes and antinodes are standing, they are not changing. Which of the following is not an example of wave interference phenomena? Um, yeah, so um, beat you've seen it in lecture. Um, uh, I guess this resonance of frequency stuff uh, that should uh, remind you of standing waves. That's what it is, and standing waves are a result of wave interference. Same here, standing waves, and I guess that leaves this um, and. Yeah, I mean, attenuation of sound waves. Yeah, it um, it doesn't ha necessarily have to do with the multiple sources of wave that's somehow adding together. So I think that's not an example of wave interference. Okay, question seven. Uh, map one is equal to the speed of sound in air, and there are some numbers that are useful to know. Like, uh, so you know, you did the lab. Um, standing waves in sound lab, so hopefully that helps you remember uh, speed of sound in air. Speed of sound at normal conditions, like uh, uh, at sea level, one atmosphere, room temperature, is about 340 meters per second. And although at the cruising altitude of airplane, it won't be this, but you know, it's a, a nice ballpark figure to use. So when something is moving at Mach 5, it should be 5 times this. So 1,700 meters per second. And I think the close number is here. I think for the purpose of this question, I probably use the actual speed of sound at the actual height. Um, I, but because of that, I also spaced out the choices enough so that if you are dealing with the rough numbers, you should, uh, like, I don't have this and uh, 175 meters per second is two competing choices. It just wouldn't work. Okay, uh, sound travels through air at a, yeah, it's <laughs> asking you about the thing that I just explained about, about 300 meters per second. And it's actually kind of fun. Uh, when you start to compare the speed of sound with the speed of light, light uh, moves at about, um, wait, it's uh, about a million times a speed of sound. Because uh, speed of sound is three times ten to the two meter per second, and light moves at three times ten to the eight meters per second. So a million times faster than sound, with no exaggeration, uh, within like a twenty percent accuracy. Uh, light moves million times faster than speed of sound. It you know it's, it sounds like something that someone just uh, made up on the spot, and it's actually numerically reasonably accurate. So it's the statement below which correctly uh, defines or describes, yeah, that's the fluid question. So density is mass per volume. Um, so won't be hardness. Uh, doesn't have necessarily have anything to do with opacity. Um, yeah, so this is the kind of the exact opposite of density. Density is the uh, property of the substance. So when you have more of the substance, you have more mass, but same density. So yeah, this is the definition of density, uh, which incorrectly describes the difference between liquids and gases. Oh, um, I hope our textbook covers that. Um, I'm sure my our physics 10 textbook does. I don't know if necessarily our fluids chapter does. Um, <laughs> it might not, but hopefully it's the kind of thing that you can answer from your general science knowledge. 
um, which is that, oh wait, this is correct. Uh, liquids maintain their volume, but get you okay, that's correct. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I think uh, without going too much into phases of matter, this is something that people can get, that this is an incorrect statement. Yes, it's too slow. All right, I think that's it. Uh, let me just to make sure I check the things. Um, yeah, so I, I hope you find this set a little bit easier than earlier sets. Um, mainly, if for no other reason, because I ran out of time in putting this together. And uh, it, okay, so um, if there aren't any questions on multiple choice timed assessment. Then let me move on to freeform. So I am using a pool uh, with a um, somewhat smaller <laughs> number of questions. So I'll just do one and not reveal uh, how small a pool I have, other than to say it is a pool. So um, given two different students, it is uh, less likely than um, or the likelihood is that two different people in class don't get the same question um, still. But it's a higher likelihood than before because my pool is so small. Uh, one thing that I will kind of warn you in case the question I get doesn't um, exhibit this, uh, some of the questions might require you to use concepts from before, like with the conservation of energy and momentum or with the static equilibria. So, you know, I say um, mostly these chapters and this is doing a lot of work and earlier mechanical concept, mechanics concepts as needed. Uh, physics is cumulative subject, just because the assessment is about oscillations and waves doesn't mean you can just uh, forget about um, the previous mechanics concepts, which might get called in as needed. So, so with that, let me keep start. Um, I genuinely don't know what I'm gonna get. So I might potentially get, okay, yeah. So this question will involve a, a collision, as you can see here. And I think in the previous, um, not the immediate previous, but the, uh, one dealing with the energy and momentum. You might have seen a similar ballistic pendulum question. This is along the same line, but you will see that it now has some parts that relate to oscillations and waves. Um, so, well, well, more oscillations than waves. So, a simple pendulum consists of a small mass m hanging at the, yeah, okay. It's describing all that, consuming the speed and collides. After they are uh, stuck together, okay, that's uh, important. So it's a completely inelastic collision, which will conserve momentum, but I won't use any conservation of energy. The pendulum swings back and forth. Okay. Uh, for each of the questions below, yeah. Uh, for the following three physical quantities, state whether or not they are conserved in this collision process. Well, Oh, I see. Yeah. So uh, total, I think I can just type an answer out here. So total mechanical energy is not conserved uh, because this is a uh, sticking, also known as completely inelastic collision. And two is actually a little bit, it can be tricky. So, um, I'm going to skip two for now and answer three. Um, so total angular momentum about pivot point is conserved. I think, uh, let me see here, uh, reason less and less. Mm. Mm. Um, okay, I'll say this, is conserved if, uh, um, the uh, friction at the pivot is uh, negligible. So I'm uh, considering this picture here. Thank you. 
a lot supported with a pivot here and I have a mess here another mess coming in and colliding and as these two things collide all the forces are internal forces which means uh, there are only internal torques the only other forces that could potentially um, produce external torque are the, are the one gravitational force but gravitational force is just downward here not exerting any torque and um, the other forces are forces at the pivot point but if we are calculating the um, angular momentum about the pivot point then the torque due to um, well the pivot uh, as long as it's uh, as long as there aren't tangential forces at the pivot as long as forces in you know in the tangential directions are zero there won't be any external force at the pivot that could change the applied torque and change angular momentum that's what this portion if the friction is negligible at the uh, pivot is about um sometimes as you're answering the questions especially you know as we go to higher levels uh, you might see that the answer the questions don't spell out all the assumptions for you because uh, sometimes the spelling out the assumptions might actually give away the answer. <laughs> so when you see something like this or when you feel like you are seeing something like that, do this. State your assumption and answer, you know, make a reasonable assumption and answer based on your reasonable assumption. Um, yeah, And you could say, you know, if uh, friction is significant, then total angular momentum is not conserved. Uh, but uh, that assumption would also make it a uh, fairly poor pendulum. So, so the I defer the, uh, the second one, total linear momentum, because I think it's one of those cases where my um, gut reaction, my intuitive reaction would have said, hmm, Oops, uh, let me just get rid of these previous marks. Uh, my intuitive reaction would have said, hmm, as these two things collide and interact, I could have some kind of pivot force here. And uh, this would be something similar to a normal force. So if I try to treat this collision as lasting a very short amount of time, this force could go up and um, so that's the first thing I would think about. And if I think about it that way, I would answer, hmm, uh, total linear momentum is not conserved um, because of the pivot force. Now, I might have said that as a matter of kind of intuitive answer. But I think in this particular case, this pivot force ends up being zero. Um, especially if this rod is massless, um, which it says it is, you know, the massless rod of length L. So really, in this entire assembly, the center of mass of that entire assembly is at where this small mass M is. So I think in this special case of this particular collision, um, the pivot force here ends up being zero. So um, to reflect what I would say is, okay, total linear momentum, uh, or let me say it this way, it could have been that the total linear momentum is not conserved uh, in this uh, interaction because of the pivot force, which I'm saying was possible. Uh, but in this uh, particular case with the massless rod, the um, pivot force ends up being zero during collision, uh, zero um, other than one needed to uh, counter gravity. Uh, so the total linear momentum should be conserved. That is impulse due to uh, net impulse due to net external forces equal to zero. So, yeah, all right, how am I doing on time? Uh, all right, I gotta go faster. Um, 
So assuming V0 is small enough that the subsequent motion can be approximated as a simple harmonic oscillator motion, calculate in terms of given quantities and symbols, um, and defining new symbols through this, angular frequency of oscillation and amplitude of oscillation. Uh, so angular frequency is actually easy uh, if we have a formula memorized. <laughs> There's a formula for natural frequency of pendulum, which is omega pendulum is a square root of g over l. Uh, am I using uh, capital L in this case? Now, if you have it memorized like me, then great, use it. Now, you know, if you don't, this is where you are allowed to use the fact that this is an open book assessment. So you don't want to do this with every single fact, but if there's a key formula that you know is in the textbook, you just don't remember what it is, then you can look it up there and use it. That's kind of what open book is for. And the, the amount of the time limitation you are given, it kind of assumes that, that you are using those resources as they become necessary. So, so yeah, I don't really need anything else because it, this is one of the, the kind of property of simple harmonic oscillator. The natural frequency of motion is a constant, doesn't depend on a lot of parameters. Um, and uh, amplitude of oscillation. So there are different ways to get at it. I think the way I would prefer to get at it is um, through the conservation of um, through the conservation of angular momentum. So what I can say is, um, so oops, I shouldn't have labeled it as a it's b. Um, so I'm saying in the collision. angular momentum or total angular momentum is conserved, which means the total angular momentum about this pivot point before the collision, um, that would have been this uh, this place or this lever arm, which um, is my L, lever arm times the momentum of the mass, so that we end with that. This and this wasn't uh, moving at all, so no angular momentum there. That's going to equal the final angular momentum after these two things stick and start to move together with some angular velocity omega. Uh, that would be i times omega. And I think I have enough intuition that this angular velocity will be the maximum angular velocity at this lowest point. And as it swings up, angular velocity will decrease to zero, and then it will come back down and swing back and forth like pendulum. So let me call this omega max. Okay, and the amplitude of oscillation. Oh, you know, I should be careful here. It's just as a note, this omega here, uh, what I'm calling angular velocity, uh, make sure you don't confuse that with omega is equal to square root of g over l. In situations like this, I would be fastidious about calling this angular frequency because uh, these two things refer to two different angles. This refers to the phase angle. This refers to physical angle. It's one of the confusing things about pendulum motion. So when it says uh, amplitude of oscillation, I think of what it's looking for is a theta max. Hmm. So there's a couple different ways to get at it. I have eight minutes. Let me just use conservation of energy. So, so this is the this handles the collision portion. Um, and and actually, so if I'm gonna use conservation of energy, I think I'm better off using. Um, uh, this expression for the final angular momentum, which is, um, so I, which would be the total mass of the whole combined thing times the L squared, that's the rotation inertia of point mass, times the omega max, or uh, what I would call V max over L. So one factor of the L cancels, this cell cancels, 
and I get a result that might appear familiar. V max is equal to um, the ratio of the masses times the initial incoming speed of the mass. This kind of analysis you've done when you did um, ballistic pendulum. Now, uh, what I want to consider is the second snapshot uh, where this whole mass has a swung up to some height. And my amplitude of oscillation is given by this theta max. And um, I'm looking at the geometry here. Um, so this delta H should be L, length of the entire thing, uh, minus this uh, portion of the thing, L cosine theta max. Um, so the conservation of energy equation that I would set it up, set up is the kinetic energy in snapshot one here, um, which is one half mass times V max squared um, is equal to the potential energy um, at this maximum height. So, um, you know, setting this as my height equals zero. Um, which is kind of implied in how I'm setting things up. So potential energy in this snapshot too, which is equal to uh, mass times G times this height H, L minus L cosine theta max. So some things cancel, uh, these cancel. I need to plug in an expression for V max um, and I have, Let's see, let me just look at the time. Five minutes, okay. I think I have enough time to solve for it. Uh, or uh, let me just do it this way. Uh, theta max can be solved by, um, so V max, which I have in my attached work and divide by M plus M times V naught, uh, plugging into uh, equation, one half times V max squared is equal to G times L minus L cos theta max. And solving for theta max uh, should give the amplitude. And um, when you imagine solving for theta max here, what you have is a bit of an ugly algebraic expression because you should be solving for, for cosine of theta max and then um, and take arc cosine. Uh, arc cosine. And um, that'll give you an answer that's uh, acceptable. Uh, there's an alternate way to do it that uh, gives a simpler expression. Uh, what it comes down to is uh, in, in the way it's been approached here, I'm not using any small angle approximation and that um, actually makes things a little difficult. And um, unless I use this version of small angle approximation, the cosine of x is uh, approximately equal to not just one, but one minus x squared over two. Uh, unless you remember the second term, it's a little bit hard to use the small angle approximation here without making things disappear. All right, I got what, two minutes? No, three minutes and a half. Okay, I think that's enough time to actually write this up. So it says, um, what is the angle theta t that the mass less rod makes with the vertical as a function of time? Ah, yeah, so this is just uh, asking you to remember mathematical expression for oscillatory motion. So I'm going to just use, um, the, use using theta max from above. Uh, in order to meet this condition, I need to uh, use sine of omega t. And I should say theta is a function of time is theta max, the amplitude times sine of omega times t, uh, uh, where, um, where omega is omega pendulum above. And I think that's it. I, you know, just want a quick 
do a quick mental check, make sure that this satisfies the conditions, this condition at t equals zero, that is equal to zero. And um, after this strikes, initially goes in the positive direction, just as sine of omega t first increases in the positive direction as it goes. And part d, uh, how much time do I have? Oh, two minutes. Well, let me first write down the answer that I know, and then, um, and then I will uh, maybe try to derive it. So uh, omega RMS is equal to uh, omega max divided by square root of two. Um, it's uh, one of those things where uh, when you are dealing with uh, a lot of oscillatory signals or not, um, it, this is uh, one of those things that you might end up memorizing. Uh, let me quickly drive it. Uh, I might run out of time as I'm driving it, but I think that'll be fine. So, um, so, you know, my omega as a function of time is going to look quite similar to this because that's basically omega as a function of time is the time derivative of the angle. So, um, well, this could get confusing, but let me try to do this. Okay. So time derivative of uh, theta max times sine of, and I will carefully label this omega of the pendulum times t. And I have to be careful not to confuse this natural oscillation frequency with uh, any other angular velocities in my setup. So when I take this derivative, um, it goes through here. And here I use a chain rule. Take the derivative of the outside and then the inside. So I should get theta max derivative to the outside is cosine of omega p t and the derivative to the inside is uh, just omega p. So I have theta max times omega p times cosine of omega p t. And this is, uh, uh, I'm going to label, choose to label this as my omega max. This is my amplitude um, in the oscillation of the, the angular velocity. So what I now need to do is basically this uh, uh, calculus thing. And um, uh, with uh, some judicious <laughs> um, uh, trig identities memorized, you can actually do that by hand uh, simply enough. Um, if not, you know, there's computer algebra system, there's all from alpha, let me just finish doing this by hand. So, um, omega RMS is equal to square root of one over T, integrate from zero to T, and uh, this thing squared. So omega max squared times cosine squared of omega P T uh, DT. Uh, all of this square root is. All right. So when you're doing this integral, really the key challenge is here. And the trig identity that you need to remember to handle this part is the power reducing formula. Um, the way I remember power reducing formula is actually by remembering the double angle formula. Cosine of two alpha is equal to cosine squared alpha minus sine squared alpha, and this has two different ways it can be written. You can choose to rewrite one or the other um, using the uh, Pythagorean theorem. So when you do that, uh, you could either rewrite this as two cosine squared alpha minus one, or uh, one minus two sine squared alpha. You can verify that on your own time. <laughs> And uh, what I'm doing for power reducing formula is I'm working backward from one with a square to the one without square. So I think the version I need to use is this one because I want to reduce the power of cosine squared. So solving this for cosine squared alpha, I have a cosine squared alpha is equal to cosine two alpha plus one divided by two. So this power reducing formula is what I need to make the correct substitution here. I need to, so identifying alpha as omega pt, I need to, um, so it's going to end up being, let me just write a version here, cosine of 2 omega pt 
plus one over two. So that's what I'm gonna need to write. I'm just gonna do an in place of substitution. Uh, cosine of two omega pt. And this might look complicated. But when you think about it, it's actually not too complicated, mainly because this integral here, you know, integral over a period of a cosine function. Actually, you know, with this factor of two, it's a integral over two periods. When you integrate a, a trig function over two periods, uh, you get zero, uh, the area under the curve of any uh, sine or cosine function over an integral period is, is zero. So, so I'm just trying to get rid of that orange thing. Uh, am I? Okay, good. So, um, so when you imagine doing the integral, uh, this will just uh, end up giving you zero. So I don't have to do the integral at all. So the only part where I am doing the integral is really this one over two, that's a constant. So when I just do that integral, this will just end up giving me one half t and evaluating from zero to period t. So, uh, so when I do all that, let me just uh, move this down so that there's room for me to write here. Um, is, so when you do this integral, it's actually pretty simple. Um, so I have under square root one over capital T times, and I have all of this, all of these are just constants. So it'll be omega max squared over two times. Now I had this T, I'm gonna be plugging in capital T and evaluate at the limit, capital T and zero. So when I do all that, I'll just have capital T, which will cancel out with this thing that was there for the purpose of averaging. So so this is what um, the root mean squared value ends up being. Um, square root of omega max squared over two. So square root of that gives me just omega max divided by square root of two. So, so that's it. That's uh, where my memorized formula comes from. So, by the way, uh, I did this as a kind of a demonstration as a, a not necessarily doing the calculus, logistics demonstration in that um, as long as you're not doing this uh, very close to midnight where you might get kicked out as you're doing this, I mean, I guess even then, as long as you're not typing things in here, you are fine. Um, so, you know, you basically worked out the answer before the time limit ran out. Then what you should do is make sure you put in the answer before the time limit runs out. In your work, you can organize it and then attach it after the time limit runs out. That's how the thing works. And what I'm demonstrating here is uh, that the system totally allows you to do that. And um, and because that 20 minute time limit is meant to be a tight amount of time, I'm not totally, I'm totally not expecting you to, wait, sorry, I can't quite get everything, okay. I'm totally not expecting you to, um, within the 20 minutes, both work out the answer and have a, a work that's uh, um, organized. I mean, you know, here, even this is actually not <laughs> as organized as it ought to be, but, um, but so kind of, you know, the kind of the things where you need to have a derivation, have a full step-by-step -step justification, those details, you can write it out after you've um, submitted an answer. So let's say work and continue, and that's it. It's all done. So, so thank you so much for um, joining, staying on. I think if there are any questions remaining, I'll um, 